you've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count it like rubbish. Everything I had before Jesus is a bunch of rubbish because I want to know and gain Christ. So Paul was not talking about losing everything just to have some intellectual knowledge. No, he was saying everything is worth losing to have a relationship with the Lord of glory. That's worth it. And whatever things we have to go through, our trials, our difficulties right now, let me tell you, it's worth it to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. Have you experienced that kind of intimacy with Jesus? Paul wasn't special or privileged. The same relationship he had with Christ is available to you. Jesus may not knock you off your feet and blind you in a life-changing revelation, but he's trying to reveal himself to you daily, usually in more subtle ways. As Pastor Ron will remind us in today's message, following Jesus won't be easy, as we see clearly in Paul's life, but it's worth the suffering for the sake of fulfilling his purpose in your life. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 as he begins his message, The Fruit of a Spiritually Focused Church. Take out your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, such great food in this passage. I might say fruit because that's really what we're going to be looking at here tonight in Ephesians chapter 4. So Ephesians 4, we're continuing our study through the book. Obviously, we've entitled it Fullness. We're looking at the fullness of who we are in Christ and how that works out as a church collectively and even as individuals. Now, if you remember last time, and I'd like you to look there to verse 11, we looked at the primary function of the church. Notice Paul says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Simply stated, we would say here that the function of the church is to be taught by its teachers, which then equips the saints for service, which then leads to the building up of the body of Christ. In other words, when pastors are teaching, the church is equipped. And when the church is equipped, the saints are serving. And when the saints are serving, everybody's blessed. We're experiencing fullness. So tonight we're going to pick up where we left off last time. Tonight we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 16, and what we really see here is really the outcome of the process we saw in the earlier verses. So just follow along as I read, beginning in verse 13, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness, there's that word again, that fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth to the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, you may have read these verses before, or maybe this is the first time you're reading through them, and you're saying, what is Paul saying? Well, let me say this. First of all, there's a lot of compacted truth right there, very obviously, right? But as we break it down, what we're going to see is really Paul is describing the fruit of a church that has its priorities right, the fruit of a church of what we saw in the previous verses. Now, all that's to say this, and I've got a long title for tonight's message. I've entitled it, The Fruit of a Spiritually Focused Church. The Fruit of a Spiritually Focused Church. When the church is functioning as it should, as we saw in the earlier verses, teachers are equipping the saints, saints are doing service, uh, the, the service church is building itself up, then what you're going to have is right here in these verses. And what we're going to see is the church, we will experience six wonderful things. And I'll just give them to you as, we, as they come. The first thing we're going to see here, the first fruit that we have when we're functioning properly is that there's spiritual unity. He says here in verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Now, what is the unity of the faith? Now, the word faith here is not describing the faith that comes when we place our trust in Jesus Christ. Notice the phrasing, in fact, in verse 13, it's called the faith. What Paul is talking about, first of all, he's already talking to believers. So what he's talking about is the full body of doctrinal truth 
which is revealed in the scriptures, and we call it the faith. When we read the book of Jude in verse 3, it tells us we're to earnestly contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the believers. See, the Bible teaches us we have one salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And that truth is found in one doctrinal grouping, you might say. 66 books that speak of God's love to us. One body of doctrinal truth. And of course, when we refer to the New Testament, it was delivered to the apostles and we call it the faith. So what he's saying here is that a spiritually focused church will have unity in the faith, the body of Christ. Unfortunately, that's not always the case, right? As we all know, there's lots of divisions within the body of Christ. Some Christians won't fellowship with other Christians because they don't raise their hands. Other Christians won't fellowship with other believers because they do raise their hands, right? Some Christians won't fellowship with other believers because they don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Other Christians won't fellowship with believers because they do believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And on and on it goes. Some Christians won't fellowship with other believers because they only believe in the King James only. If it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for us. Glad you figured that one out, right? And on it goes. The reality is, those kind of divisions, that's the flesh. That's carnal. Paul said to the Corinthian church, it's 1 Corinthians 3, 3, he says, where there's envy, strife, and divisions, aren't you just carnal? Yes. So we never, as a body of believers, as part of the whole body of Christ, want to look down our spiritual noses and go, well, they, they don't do the exact same thing we do, you know? No. We want to support those churches that hold to the truths of the faith, right? We want to pray for them. Now, with that, let me add, we're not talking about a unity at any cost, right? Our unity in the faith is only possible when it's built on the foundation of the once and for all delivered faith, right? It must be based on that. In other words, there can be no unity in the church apart from what the Bible teaches. So that does tell us that there must be doctrinal clarity, there must be doctrinal integrity, and even though that's true, that doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything, but we will agree on the essentials, right? We're going to agree on the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. We're going to agree on the inerrancy of Scripture, the vicarious death of Jesus Christ on the cross for the sins of the world, and so forth. And so there can never be a unity at any cost. There must be a unity of the faith. But the first thing that Paul is letting us know here is that when the church has its priorities right... The church is going to be spiritually sound, and they're going to experience unity. I enjoy the unity we have as a fellowship. The second result of a spiritually focused church is spiritual intimacy. Look at verse 13. He says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, when Paul talks about the knowledge of the Son of God, he's not talking about the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Again, he's writing to the Ephesian believers. We would also note he's not talking about an intellectual knowledge. In other words, when we come together as a body of believers, it's all about learning some intellectual concepts about Jesus. No. We don't come here week after week to uh, sink our brains deep in deep thoughts of religion. Ah, oh, that's heavy. We don't come here every single week or midweek thinking, my, that was a powerful passage. I, I never realized that was the Greek word. Although that's great that we're seeking to draw truths out, that's not the whole point. It's not intellectual stimulus. That's not the goal. Some of you know, you, you went to a secular university. You know, some secular universities and colleges actually offer religious courses. And they actually talk about Jesus. They talk about the Bible, but it's in connection with uh, philosophy or quote-unquote religion. That's religion. That's head knowledge. That is not what Paul was talking about here. I mean, you can have a head full of Bible knowledge, right? But a heart full of sin. Isn't that true? Sure it is. So Paul's not talking about intellectual knowledge. You say, well, what is he talking about? Well, the word knowledge here is the Greek word epignosis. And it means a knowledge that comes through experience, through experience. See, it's one thing to know about the Son of God. It's one thing to know about Jesus. It's another thing to know Him, 
to know him, to have a relationship with him, to be intimate with him. Jesus put it this way in John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. Now, when he says, I know them, he says, well, I know who they are because of course he does. He's God. That's not what it means. That term know means to have an intimate relationship. I have an intimate relationship with those who are my children. That's what Jesus is saying. So Paul's not talking about an intellectual knowledge here. He's talking about this intimate relationship that comes with Christ. Oh, there's a great verse in the book of Philippians. Philippians 3, 8, Paul says this, Yet I indeed count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I count everything as nothing just so I can have more intellectual knowledge of Jesus. No. No, he's talking about that epignosis, that relationship. For whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count it like rubbish. Everything I had before Jesus is a bunch of rubbish because I want to know and gain Christ. So Paul was not talking about losing everything just to have some intellectual knowledge. No, he was saying everything is worth losing to have a relationship with the Lord of glory. That's worth it. And whatever things we have to go through, our trials, our difficulties right now, let me tell you, it's worth it to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. He actually goes on later in verse 10 of that same chapter, Philippians. He says, that I might know him, same word again, that I can know him and the power of his resurrection and even the fellowship of his sufferings. I love it. I fellowship in the sufferings he had and even being conformed to his death. So that intimate relationship with the Savior. So what Paul is saying here in verse 13 is this. When you have a church that is spiritually focused, the teachers are teaching, the saints are serving, right? Right? Then it's members, that's us, that's the body of believers. We're going to be moved way beyond an intellectual knowledge of Jesus. We're going to have a real relationship with Jesus. And isn't that why we're here? I hope that's why you're here. That's why I'm here. I'm not coming to get some emotional pick-me-ups. Woohoo! That was awesome. Go cheerlead Ron. That's awesome. No, no. I'm not coming to get pumped up emotionally. I'm not coming here to get my mind filled with some intellectual data. I want to grow in my relationship with Christ. And listen, when you come for that purpose, that becomes the greatest pick-me-up of all, doesn't it? You know, it really does. That changes our life. So the fruit of a spiritually focused church is, number one, spiritual unity. So we all come to that unity of the faith. That's what happens when we're focused. And then we have spiritual intimacy, knowing the Son of God. But then there's a third one, even in this same verse, in verse 13, Paul says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, this is a real powerful verse. And first of all, let me say this. The word perfect there doesn't mean perfect as we think of it in our own language. In other words, sinless. The word means complete or better yet, mature. Paul tells us here that God wants us to Mature, to grow up. To mature to what? To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God's desire for every believer is that we would grow up to be like his son, Jesus. Now that's a mind-blowing thought, isn't it? Romans chapter 8 and verse 29 tells us this. Whom God foreknew, speaking the fact that God has chosen us, we're believers. He also predestined, listen to this, to be conformed into the image of of his son. He has saved us to be conformed into the image of his son. Now, none of us in this life are going to get there, right? We're not going to measure up to the fullness of Christ, right? But that's our goal, and our model is Jesus. And what Paul is saying here is this in verse 13 that when a church is spiritually focused, it will produce believers that are growing in Christ's likeness. It'll produce believers like yourselves that are maturing in the faith. In 1 Peter 5.10, Peter writes, May the God of all grace, who called us to eternal glory in Christ Jesus, mature you and establish you and strengthen you. Now, this is what we call the process of sanctification. It's a big religious word. You've probably heard it before, sanctification, you know. I'm being sanctified. What does that mean? It is the ongoing process whereby God is taking us and making us like Christ. We're not there, but that's what we're seeking to do, to mature, become like Jesus. It's a process. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, We all with unveiled face one day 
Well, right now we're beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. But guess what? Right now we're being transformed into the image of God from glory to glory. So right now we're being transformed. So right now we're growing. We're, we're becoming like Christ. That's what happens when you have a spiritually focused church in the Word of God. I was thinking of this today. I grabbed this. I know I look totally dorky with this thing on. <sighs> yeah, totally dorky. But this was my hat that I had, I was given, when we were building this building. When we, it was under construction, we had to wear a hard hat whenever we came into the facility. And those of you on staff, you remember that, even some of you that helped do some of the work here. We had to wear this. And it was a reminder that this place is under construction. Well, wouldn't that be good if we all wore hard hats like this? And it was a reminder to all of us, under construction. So please forgive me when I blow it, because I'm going to blow it. And you're going to blow it. But that big, giant, white hat reminds me, you're going to blow it. That's okay. I'm also, though, have a goal when I'm wearing this. If I say I'm being sanctified, if I say I'm a believer, I'm under construction. Yes, I'm going to not be perfect, but I want to be that way. I want to be more like my Savior, Jesus. So that's really the process. It's a process, sanctification. But the reality is we are becoming conformed into the image of God. We're becoming more Christ-like. Now, the Bible does teach us something quite interesting. It teaches us that what we worship is what we become. What you worship is what you become. By the way, that's not only found in the Bible. I would say that's also a philosophical axiom. That's a truth that we would see that I think most people would agree to. Uh, what do you mean? Well, if your God is materialism, you become like your God. You become materialistic. If your God is pleasure, if you live for pleasure, you'll become like your God. You'll become licentious. If your God is about making a name for yourself, you'll be proud and self-consumed. So David spoke of this in the scriptures. In fact, in Psalm 115 and verse 5, he was talking about those who, who worship graven images, gods of stone and wood. And he said this in Psalm 115 and verse 5, they have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes they don't see. That's pretty obvious. They have ears they don't hear. They have noses they don't smell. They have hands they don't handle. They have feet, but they don't walk. And then he said this, and those who make them are like them. And so is everyone who trusts in them. So the reality is you become like who you worship. You begin to become like your God. What you worship will determine what you become. But here's the great thing. Because Christ has saved us, he's redeemed us, and we're spiritually focused, and we're seeking to grow in his love and a relationship with him. Over a process of time, we begin to take on qualities of our Savior. We begin to take on qualities of our Lord. We begin to grow. We begin to mature. Now, I'm certainly, I don't, I'm not perfect. You all, yes, exactly, we know that. And none of us are. But I can honestly say, having now walked with the Lord 33 years, I'm not who I used to be. There have been some changes. And it wasn't me saying, I'm going to change myself. It was the Lord. It's the Lord that does that. And when you're part of a fellowship of believers, where you're growing in the unity of faith, where you're growing in God's word, then what happens is this begins to happen very naturally. God begins to change us. And so right now we're under construction. God is steadily conforming us into the image of his son. And then, you know what we have to look forward in the future? One day, let me read to you from 1 John 3, 2. One day we shall be like him. Now that is pretty radical. That's a staggering thought. There will be a day when we will be fully mature, fully complete, fully perfect. Until that day, we want to be part of a fellowship that is focused on the priorities that God has set forth. And one of the byproducts is just spiritual maturity. So I know that as I've interacted with some of you over the years, you, you begin to see that in some of God's people. Wow, what a difference God has made. I remember when I first met them, you know. What a work God does. Okay, let's move on. So the fruit of spiritually focused church, spiritual unity, spiritual intimacy, spiritual maturity. Number four, spiritual discernment. What a need this is. This is one of our biggest problems. And why is that? Why would spiritual discernment be one of the biggest problems in the church of America today? I'll tell you why. Because the priorities are wrong. 
The church, many churches in America aren't doing what it says in verses 11 and 12. The pastors aren't equipping the saints. And therefore, the saints aren't doing the work of the ministry and the body is not being built up. And because of that, there's a lack of discernment. Now, let me say this. There are a lot of churches who say they teach the Bible. They may even open the Bible. But what has happened over the years? Over the years, we now have women who are pastors. We now have churches that perform same-sex marriages. We have churches that have allowed strange doctrines to enter in and on down the line. How does that happen? How do people come to a church? How does a congregation that leave and allow that to happen? I'll tell you why. Because they haven't been taught the line-by-line -line teaching of God's word. They haven't been taught the word from Genesis to Revelation. They've only been giving piecemeal of different doctrines. And what happens is we don't have the whole counsel of God. You don't have discernment. You don't have discernment. So how important it is, as I said from last week, how we have to be spiritually focused. Because if not, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say as you take it out of context. But when you take the Word of God as it's meant to be read, as it's meant to be taught, which is book by book, line upon line, staying within context, it'll keep your doctrine in check. And it'll keep you in check. And it'll keep you in line. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, we talked about this last time, right? He said, rightly divide the word of God. Timothy, rightly divide it. Cut it straight. And when you have a pastor, when you have churches that will do that, who will teach the whole counsel of God, not just some doctrine they want. I mean, because, you know, there are churches just need to remind you that it's the same thing all the time. It's faith, 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 faith. Or every week it's healing, 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 healing. Or it's give, 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 give. Or whatever it is, right? It's just, it's out of line. It's the same thing. But when you have a church that will teach the whole counsel of God's word, the believer is spiritually equipped, and one of the natural byproducts is discernment. And here's the benefit. Look at verse 14. That we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So Paul says, we need to do this so that we no longer be children. You know, one of the characteristics of a child is that they can be easily fooled, right? A young child doesn't have enough years of wisdom to acquire any kind of discernment. And so you can easily trick a child. You can easily deceive a child, right? Even if it's for fun. My young little grandkids think, oh, you know, I hold something out in my hand. Which hand is it behind? I drop it behind me. It's not there. It's like, wow, Poppy, you're amazing. I know, I know. <laughs> They're just easily deceived. And spiritual children are the same way. A spiritual child who hasn't grown up can easily be fooled and fall prey to doctrines. Notice the imagery he uses here. He says, spiritual children are tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine. The picture that he's painting here is a vessel that's caught at sea. And it has no anchor. And because it has no anchor, which is the word of God, it's being tossed by the winds everywhere the storm wants to take it. A spiritual child is the same way. They are tossed to and fro by various things. Or they go on a religious circuit searching for some new touch, some new tingle, some new enlightenment. And we're told here they fall prey by the trickery of men. That word trickery is an interesting word. It's kubia. Kubia, where we get our word cube, but it, it spoke of dice. That's where the original word comes from. So you, the tossing of the dice, you know, over time became synonymous with the dishonesty and trickery. And so people that have no discernment fall prey to the trickery of men. He adds, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now, it's not hard to figure out what Paul is saying here. Paul's telling us that Satan takes advantages of churches that don't teach the word, right? Because in churches that don't teach the word, you have believers that lack discernment. And so Satan will use cunningly crafty men who will deceitfully plot their demise, seeking to bring them down. Thank you for joining us here today on Larger Than Life as we go through the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7 says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. 
By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Larger Than Life is a ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint. All of us here want you to know and experience the incredible, awesome love of God. And on our website, ltlradio.org, you'll find so many ways to learn more about that love. We have many more messages under Teaching Archive. You can find a link to download our mobile app there on the website or listen to Larger Than Life in podcast format too. This will give you access to every single one of Pastor Ron's messages and many other encouraging resources. Also on our website, there's a tab labeled Visit Calvary Houston where you can learn more about the church. Once again, that website is ltlradio.org. Thank you so much for coming today. We're at the end of our time together, but we'll be back with more on Larger Than Life.